Uh, the project came out of uh, my visits to Europe and learning about offshore wind farms over there that have been installed and operating since 92. They have about 40 of them. And uh, back here in the southeast, we don't have any commercially viable wind resource in on land uh, because there's just not enough wind to make it commercially viable. But uh, I, when I came back from Europe after being there for a while and lectured, I started looking at the offshore wind potential off the coast of Georgia, and people were not looking at offshore wind back then. This was in 2005, and uh, finally it started getting getting uh, information about the wind resources out there that looked encouraging from existing wind data out on Navy platforms, and uh, went to Southern Company and got a project with them that they funded jointly. Then we had a team that was made up of Georgia Power people as well as Georgia Tech uh, engineers and, and faculty to uh, work on the whole system aspect of assessing and designing a wind farm off the coast of Georgia and seeing if it would be viable. And uh, we met every month, and I think Georgia Power learned a lot about wind energy, offshore in particular, and we learned a lot about the, the electric utility industry. It covered many uh, disciplines, from marine engineering to, to meteorolo meteorological, uh, earth and atmospheric sciences people, uh, and uh, power distribution people for power cabling underwater, and, and uh, many, many aspects. So uh, it was really a good project, and we ended up using the, the, the bottom line is always commercial liability. What's the cost? You know, technology-wise, we can do almost anything that you can dream up that you come up with. But uh, whether it's whether it's commercially viable depends on economics, and so we we did the economic studies and, and optimized the design to produce the, the most electricity at the least cost, and. Uh, it came, the only offshore wind construction data, which is the primary cost, there's very little operating cost, even the offshore maintenance is not severe, it's about two cents a kilowatt hour to maintain them, but uh, there's no fuel cost, so dominantly it's just amortization of the capital cost. And using the European cost data, we had European cost data for about 25 wind farms over there, and all, they had it all broken out. The underwater cabling cost, the pylon cost, the rotor cost, the generator cost, uh, installation, and uh, all included. And uh, using those costs, uh, it came out to about 12 cents a kilowatt hour in 2008 dollars, uh, which is very competitive for any renewable energy. Solar, even currently, is around 20 cents per kilowatt hour, and this is unsubsidized. Uh, of course, you get subsidies for both, but uh, this is the unsubsidized. Even with the reduced cost of solar cells, uh, that's still about 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, but you, from the federal government, you can get a third of that paid for. Uh, but uh, the problem, that, that cost is really unrealistic right now to crank up the industry over here because we don't have the expertise in installing these wind farms where the turbines are available. The same turbines have been used in Europe and are being used in Europe. But uh, the installation, you have to have an infrastructure, marine equipment and ships and boats and things in order to uh, install these and then maintain them. So the cost here that's being quoted is significantly above what the European cost is, and uh, but there are several projects up and down the Atlantic that are being uh, uh, taught, being proposed, and trying to get funding and approval for. None are actually in the construction at this time. Permitting is an issue. People worry about the viewscape, or you can't just to get in the way of shipping channels, uh, environmentally sensitive areas. So the permitting is a difficult and long process. Uh, but there's headway being made there. And uh, Southern Company currently has an application for a lease of 
an area out off the coast of Georgia to put an anemometer up uh, that would they would run for three or four years or if necessary to get wind data on the site that we recommended because we didn't have any wind data on what appeared to be the best site from the wind data we got uh, in various places around the ocean off the coast of Georgia. Some of them were buoys, some of them were on Navy platforms, some of them were 15 feet off the surface, some of them were 165 feet off the surface, and of course we can model all that on the, with the wind shear that takes into account the higher speed as you get off of the, uh, off of the uh, surface of the ocean. Uh, but they, they want to get uh, good data on the site that looks like it's the best site that's close in for cabling to a substation and uh, depending on that data and depending on the uh, uh, market and the environment we'll uh, hope they'll move forward with that and the economics will look, look very competitive. I'm, I'm convinced it'll be competitive with solar. Solar is still pretty expensive, it's subsidized pretty heavily. Wind's got a small subsidy, it's uh, due, to be, due to end at the end of this year for wind farms and uh, there's no proposal for it to be renewed at this point. So that's a question about the future of the wind market and new wind farms even off the coast and on shore. Yes, we're getting more energy from more renewable energy from wind than anything else by a large measure and the growth rate is very high. Uh, the problem that we're facing is a transmission distribution problem. Uh, the best wind resource is in the middle of the country out around Kansas and where in Idaho and uh, Iowa, excuse me, and uh, where there's not many people and the electrical load is not high so they have to transmit it tra from the wind farms out in the deserts and country where there's nobody living to the east coast or, or Chicago or somewhere where there's an, a load that can use it and they can sell it to. And those transmission lines are become, have become saturated and uh, during the peak wind conditions the wind farms are putting out more than the transmission lines will permit and will carry. So there's, there's a regulatory issue with uh, FERC and the laws that they have to operate on FERC being the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that has to approve all transmission lines. And there's a policy a legislative uh, issue there that doesn't give much incentive for private investors or utilities to install uh, transmission lines. So that's, uh, that's what's limiting wind right now. The best place that we can get the cheapest electricity from wind, which is the Midwest. But uh, some of it depends on this, uh, whether the subsidy will be renewed. But we will continue to get more and more electricity from wind, uh, no matter what happens. Uh, it's only how fast the growth will be.